Welcome back, Daisy Cakes. This is another edition of my series of top 100 science fiction authors. I am Daisy X Machina, the drag queen detective who investigates all things speculative in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. This is part eight of a 10 part series of top 100 science fiction authors listed in alphabetical order in groups of 10. So let's get started. Last time we left off with a Robinson, Kim Stanley Robinson. Now we're going to pick up with another Robinson, Spider Robinson. Spider Robinson is a Canadian author born in 1948. Although he was originally born in America, he was a Canadian citizen for most of his life. He's won three Hugos and a Nebula. He started off with the publication of a short story titled The Guy with the Eyes, in the February 1973 edition of Analog Magazine. That story, his first story, was set in a bar called Callahan's Place. Fast forward to 1977, and we have the publication of an anthology called Callahan's Crosstime Saloon. Now, I don't usually recommend short story anthologies, but like I frequently say, there's always an exception. If you want whimsical, funny, raunchy, ridiculous stories, you can't go wrong visiting Callahan's Bar and meeting time travelers, an ethical vampire, a talking dog, extraterrestrials, and all manner of wacky customers. And if you want more, Robinson produced several more anthologies and full-length novels about Callahan's Crosstime Saloon. Another interesting fact about Robinson is that he was chosen by the Heinlein Estate to write Variable Star, published in 2006, which is a novel based on an outline that Heinlein wrote in 1955 but never finished himself. Mary Rosenblum is an author that not many people know, but they should. She was born in 1952 and died suddenly in 2006 at the age of 65 in an accident while piloting a single-engine plane over the state of Washington. Her debut was in science fiction with The Dry Lands, published in 1993, which won the Compton Award for Best First Novel. In 1999, she started a series of cozy mysteries under the pen name Mary Freeman with Devil's Trumpet, whose amateur sleuth is a landscaper named Rachel O'Connor. My recommendation is a little-known gem called The Stone Garden, published in 1994. It's about these mysterious asteroids that attract a special kind of artist who then carves the stone into sculptures that give off emotions. But then the sculptors start getting brutally murdered, and the remaining sculptors have to figure out the mystery fast before they are targeted next. By the way, Mary Rosenblum's books are really hard to find. They are not available as e-books, so you have to hunt down used copies at used bookstores or eBay or something. But trust me, it'll be worth it. Joanna Russ was born in 1937 and died in 2011 at the age of 74. Russ was first and foremost a feminist, so it should be no surprise that she wrote the seminal premier feminist science fiction novel, The Female Man, in 1975. I think this should be required reading for any science fiction fan who calls themselves a feminist or who supports the feminist movement. It follows the lives of four women from four parallel universes. Joanna, which is, of course, a stand-in for the author Joanna Russ, who exists in our world in, of course, the 1970s when the novel was written. Then there's Janine, who lives in a world where the Great Depression never ended and World War II never happened, so women never joined the workforce and are stuck in stereotypical gender roles. Janet is from the utopia of While Away, where men were killed by a plague so only women exist. And finally, there's Jail, who is from a dystopia where men and women are literally at war. The four women are versions of the same woman are able to visit each other and grow from their interactions. It's a short novel, so it's a quick read, but it is dense with ideas and a touchstone for feminist fiction. Fred Saberhagen was born in 1930 and died in 2007 at the age of 77. He began his science fiction writing career by publishing 
short stories as early as 1961. While developing as a writer, he was an editor for the Encyclopedia Britannica for its chemistry article from 1967 to 1973. He became a full-time author in 1975 and was very prolific, including a series of novels from Dracula's point of view, which starts with the Dracula tape published in 1975. But what I recommend is his epic space opera that starts with Berserker, published in 1967. The first novel is a fix-up of several of Saberhagen's short stories about Berserker machines, which are remnants of doomsday weapons left over from an intergalactic war that has long since passed, and humans are left to encounter these self-replicating machines of destruction. They're kind of like the anti-Bob from Dennis Taylor's Bobiverse. Over the years, Saberhagen followed up with well over a dozen berserker novels and anthologies, which also spawned a board game. If you read science fiction today, you probably know who John Scalzi is. Scalzi was born in 1969 and has won or been nominated for many awards, including the Hugo, the Nebula, the Locus, and many others. He released his first novel, Agent of the Stars, on his website in 1997 and offered it for free in 1999. His first traditionally published novel was the military sci-fi novel Old Man's War, published in 2005 with a 75-year-old protagonist, which became the first in a series of novels about the old man. <laughs> Scalzi is known for his humor and his wit. My recommendation is Starter Villain, published in 2023, because look at the cover. <laughs> I picked it for Shelf It or Shove It. It's about an everyman loser named Charlie who is down on his luck and scrapes by with his cats. Suddenly, he inherits his estranged uncle's parking garage business. But surprise, he finds out it's a front for a supervillain business, complete with a secret volcano island lair and super intelligent cats who are the administrators or something. <laughs> I think Starter Villain works with Scalzi's humor and such a ridiculous plot. Robert Silverberg was born in 1935 and is still active today at the age of 89. He's won multiple Hugos and Nebulas and is a grandmaster of science fiction. He's attended every single Hugo Award ceremony since 1953. His first novel was a juvenile sci-fi novel, Revolt on Alpha C, published in 1955, which won him his first Hugo as Best New Writer. He went on to a very distinguished career in science fiction, writing and editing over 500 books. You heard me right, 500! My favorite Silverberg novel is Lord Valentine's Castle, published in 1980, which was originally serialized in the magazine of science fiction and fantasy. In this novel, we are introduced to Majipur, a backwater planet populated by humans and aliens. Valentine has lost his memory, so of course he joins a traveling troop of jugglers. <laughs> Slowly, he begins realizing that something is really off about this world. Hmm. I think this is a really fun book. Clifford D. Simak is another distinguished science fiction writer, but somehow he never got quite as famous as his peers. Simak was born in 1904 and died in 1988 at the age of 83. He got his start during the Golden Age science fiction, publishing short stories as early as 1931. He was named a Grandmaster of Science Fiction in 1977 and was very prolific, winning three Hugos and a Nebula, and was best friends with Isaac Asimov. He is known as a pioneer of a subgenre called pastoral science fiction, that is, science fiction stories in rural settings. He's probably best known for City, published in 1952, a fix-up novel about an extinct species known as humans, as told by dogs. But I'm going to recommend a strange little book he wrote in 1976 called Shakespeare's Planet, which wasn't well-received, but I thought it was amazing. Maybe there's no accounting for taste. It's about a space traveler named Carter Horton, who is in deep sleep as his ship searches for a colony planet for humans. He wakes up to find he's the only one of the crew left alive. 
The three other crew members are now disembodied minds of the ship known as the Monk, the Scientist, and the Grand Dam. They arrive at a planet that could be suitable, but there's an alien that lives there named Carnivore who claims that a human was there before named Shakespeare. The novel doesn't have a traditional plot. There's a lot of dialogue and philosophy and rumination, but darn it, I still think it's one of Simak's best works. Dan Simmons was born in 1948 and is still active today at the age of 76. He started writing short stories in the 80s, and his mentor was Harlan Ellison. They also both shared the same agent. Although he also writes horror, such as Summer of Night, published in 1991, he is best known for the science fiction series that starts with Hyperion, published in 1989, and won the Hugo. The series is called the Hyperion Cantos, which makes sense because it's inspired and structured like the Canterbury Tales. It's a frame story about a group of pilgrims, each telling their own tale. The pilgrimage is on the world of Hyperion, which houses the time tombs where the Shrike lives, a mechanical demigod, sort of, that allegedly can grant wishes. This is set in the far future where humanity is connected through high-tech portals so they can travel between worlds. The hegemony of man lives uneasily next to the Technocore, a civilization of AIs. Hyperion is on almost everyone's list of top sci-fi novels, including mine. Have you ever heard of Cordwainer Smith? That's the pseudonym of Paul Linebarger, who was born in 1913 and died in 1966 at the very young age of 53. His first story was published in a high school magazine in 1928 called War Number 81Q, which can be found on Project Gutenberg. But he didn't really start his writing career until the 1950s when he began selling short stories to the science fiction pulp magazines. Most of his stories are set in a universe he created called The Instrumentality of Mankind. So I picked up probably his most famous novel because of the wackadoodle cover, Norstrelia, published in 1975. You may notice this was published posthumously. He died in 1966. It's a fix-up of two novels published in the early 60s. Norstrelia is the contraction of a planet named after Old North Australia, Norstrelia. Norstrelia is the only planet that produces strewn, an anti-aging drug. So it is the wealthiest planet in the galaxy, which lets their human inhabitants preserve their archaic way of life as Australian ranchers because they raise a special type of mutant sheep that produces the strewn. Roderick is one of the heirs to one of these old Norstrillian families and must develop his telepathic powers before someone kills him. We end this group of 10 with Norman Spinrad. Spinrad was born in 1940 and is active today at the age of 84. His first novel was a space opera called The Solarians, published in 1966. His next novel was Bug Jack Baron, published in 1969, which caused a bit of a controversy at the time because it was funded by the British Arts Council, and a member of Parliament didn't like the book and didn't think it should be funded, either because of the explicit language or maybe because of its cynical view of politicians. Hmm. Spinrad wrote the script for the original Star Trek episode, The Doomsday Machine, which was nominated for a Hugo. But the novel I recommend is very strange, Maybe it's offensive, I don't know, but it was so weird it left an indelible stamp on my memory. It's called The Void Captain's Tale, published in 1983. The premise is that in the far future, ships can travel through the void, which is uh, basically a form of hyperspace. Pilots are women with psychic powers who experience powerful orgasms when they travel through the void. The story is about the captain of one of the ships who is infatuated with his pilot, and that pilot wants to be free of everything, including her body. The story is as strange as it sounds, 
maybe not for everyone, but one that you won't forget. That ends the eighth installment of my top 100 science fiction writers. Or any of these your favorites, let me know down in the comments. And while you're there, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my Chanel. Don't forget to also check out my list of top 100 fantasy authors. Until we meet again, may all the books you read be 